Super Clever 1972. I'm back. I've been gone on a vacation. I was on vacation last week. Uh, I was gone on, I think it was the 20th. I left on the 20th and I came back on, uh, well, let's see, it's, uh, I think the 29th maybe it was a Sunday anyways and I've been back since um, so I haven't been on for a while I think it's been three weeks um, I was going to be on um, at another point I was going to be on not last Saturday, but the previous Saturday, but I only watched two films. Um, so I decided to um, just include those with the films I've seen currently. Um, so uh, if I look at my calendar for a second here. Um, Yeah, I, 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 I'm sorry for pulling you up. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So, so let's. So, anyways, I got ten films uh, that I've watched since I've last been on here, showing my, you know, talking about movies I've seen and showing the ones that I have physical copies of. Um, so, I have a few I have physical copies of, and I also have a few. Um, probably more films that I watched streaming online. Um, I think all the streaming ones are. Oh no, no, I'm wrong. Uh, mo almost all the ones streaming are movie related. M U B I, the the uh, film stream site, a movie streaming ser service, which shows like the um, avant garde and documentaries and classics and. You know, festival winners and, um, but yeah, so, yeah. Um, but I also watched one from Shudder, which is a hor horror um, streaming site as well. So that'll be the last one I talk about. So anyways, the first one I watched was on Thursday, July 12th. Uh, I watched two films on here that star Alec Guinness, and this one was called The Man in the White Suit. Um, this was directed by Alexander McKendrick, who, who directed, among other things, Sweet Smell of Success. Um, Alec Guinness plays this guy who works at a textile factory, and he finds this, this fiber that won't um, get dirty, um, you know, won't go bad. And, uh, of course, the, the people at the textile factory don't want this thing this new textile to become, you know, um, sold to the consumer because then it would ruin business for them. That they'd be out of business. Um, but but there's a twist, which is cool. You know what happens at the end. It's kind of funny. It's kind of slapstick. Kind of the movie, um, in a sense, in a certain way, it's kind of slapstick. You know, very visually, it's kind of silly and. Um, I guess uh, dialogue-wise, it's kind of maybe it's kind of silly dialogue-wise. I'm, I'm not sure, but anyways, so out of um, five stars, I'd give this film. Well, let's see. I give it three three stars out of five. It's a good film. Maybe not a great film. I, I, the, the twist at the end makes it a good, you know, bumps it up. Um, I don't know if three and a half is, I, I give it three. So, okay, so the, the second film I saw is a film called Lisa, also goes under the title of Bitch. It came out in 1972. Oh, The Man in the White Suit, I, I guess I, I didn't put the date on that. Um, but it was on a streaming site, so I, I don't know, I don't remember what the date was. Anyways, the second one is 72, 
and it's it's called Lisa, who's played by uh, Catherine Deneuve. It's also called Bitch. Um, Marcel Mastriani plays. They're, they're the two leading characters in the movie. And Marcel Mastriani lives on this island, and he has a dog. And at some point, something happens to the dog, and and Catherine Deneuve becomes more involved with with him. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but so, so she, for, for some reason she, could, she becomes more involved with him. And also, there's a there's a um, appearance by Michelle Piccoli, who is also with Deneuve in um, Belle de Jour. She's been in other move, French movies. Um, I can't remember if this film is Italian. Well, I think the when you're watching the movie in subtitles. I think it's spoken in Italian, even though two of the actors are French, of course. And it's directed by Marco Fer Ferreri, uh, who did Dillinger's Dead. I, I have Dillinger's Dead. I've never watched it. Not that I don't want. Not that I don't want to watch it. It's just I haven't got around to doing it yet. And uh, Michelle Piccoli, Michelle Piccoli is in that too, I believe. And Anita Pallenberg, I believe, is in that. Anita Pallenberg was, um, I think. At three, well, she was Mick Jagger's girlfriend, I think, and Keith Richards at one point, and maybe even Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones. Um, Jean Claude Carrier helped with the screenplay, or maybe wrote, the, wrote, I think he collaborated on the screenplay. I'm not sure, but, um, anyways, it's, oh, it's a joint Italian French production, but it was spoken in Italian, the dialogue. So I give this film um, uh, three and a half stars out of five. Next up, we've got Monday, July 16th. It was another film by director Alexander McKendrick from Ealing Studios, which I guess all of these films that they were showing it's a retrospective on movie from Ealing, Ealing Studios. It's called The Maggie. It's from 1954. It's about a, it's like a tugboat, and this wealthy man, this wealthy American's goods are being transported on it to from one area of, of uh, the UK to another, and I guess it's a Scottish part of, of England uh, or, or the UK. Um, and basically, these guys that run the tugboat, well, there's there's some older men and a young boy, and he's kind of mad at them for being slow. And but things change, and it's it's an okay movie. I'm not I wasn't wild about it. Um, it's not a bad movie, but it's just um, it's not great either. I, I give this film. Oh, I don't know. Um, maybe three stars. Fairly good. It's it's okay, but it's not great. Okay, so next next one. Oh, I didn't put. The, oh, oh, it's because I watched it on the same day. That's right. Okay, so the next one I watched is the same day, Monday, July July sixteenth. It, it's a film called Convoy. It came out in seventy eight. And it's directed by Sam Peckinpah. It stars Chris Christopherson, Ali McGraw, and Ernest Borgnine. And uh, I guess Seymour Cassell's in it too. I think he's a European actor. Executive producer is Michael Dealey, who um, sort of moved Blade Runner, it, it helped it into creation. You know, he was. If you watch the documentary with the Blade Runner box set, Dangerous Days, and you see uh, Hampton Fancher submit um, writing samples to, uh, or treatments or whatever, to, um, is it Richard Kelly or David Kelly? I don't know. Anyways, this, the Kelly, the guy named Kelly, he submits it to Michael Dealey, and a few times it's rejected, and then, then <coughs> Dealey re reads one of the newer drafts of the Blade Runner type story, and, and that's what compelled it to 
you know, become, you know, go further and become, you know, directed by Ridley Scott and all that stuff and become history. But anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. Um, but, you know, this is before Blade Runner. And, you know, it has, a, it has Sam Peckinpah's signature on it. It has the, the uh, slow motion, you know, the fist fights and the, um, uh, the, the, the frenetic edit. Ed is it the right word be frenetic? The editing is kind of, um, it has that Sam Peckinpah-esque kind of editing. If, you, if you've watched A Wild Bunch, and if you watch Straw Dogs, then you know what I'm talking about, you know, if you notice. So it has those fist fights, you know, instead of, instead of, you know, because he made Westerns, this is not really, quote, a Western, because it's, it's involving 18 wheelers, um, and Chris Christopherson's character, all these, tri all these 18 wheelers are joining him on the road, and they're being chased by cops, and, his, his, his character name is Rubber Duck, Rubber Ducky, or something like that, um, which really isn't explained that well. And um, Alan McGraw at the start is like wearing no underwear when she's driving down the road, and he's pulling he's pulling alongside her in his 18 wheeler, Chris Christopherson, and Ernest Bor Borgnine is getting real pissed off at them because they're they're filling up both lanes on the road, and the motivations for the characters don't seem to make any sense. Um, you know, there's like a, there's like a um, reference to racism that one of the black, one of the characters is a black driver, and he goes, he separates from the convoy Maybe his wife is pregnant. I can't remember the reason why he leaves. And they, they, they put him in a jail cell, the, the cops, and they, I think they beat him up. And, well, I, I don't want to give up too much, but something happens, and I won't say anything about that. But um, the motivations didn't seem clear to me. Like, why, why, are, these, why are all these trucks joining Chris, Chris Christopherson? Maybe it's some kind of parable. Maybe he's trying to say something. Maybe there's some kind of point to it. I, I don't know if I quite get it. Um, and, um, yeah, it has, like, country music in it. And uh, Another one of the Sam Peckinpah signatures in it is at the end when Chris Christopherson is headed someplace. I won't say where. They have the machine guns going. And the editing, like the fist fights, is very like the end of Wild Bunch. You know, the slow motion and the um, rapid cutting and all that. You know, just that. If you if you didn't see this film, you're not missing much, in my opinion. Um, I give this film two stars or two and a half. Maybe I give it two. Well, I don't know, two and a half or two. I give it two and a half because it barely is trying to uh, make something of itself. Maybe it's trying to make a point, I'm not sure. But um, there's another scene in the film that doesn't make any sense. Well, it makes certain sense to me. All these people are, are taking a shower. Of course, they're not all naked, but they're standing in this area where, where they spray where these water spouts are and they're washing themselves and that didn't make any sense to me and all these press people are interviewing Chris Christopherson and trying to ask him what, what's the point of what you're doing and I don't know it's, it's a forgettable movie in my opinion okay so Tuesday July 17th I watched The Producers which is a film directed by Mel Brooks and starring Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder. And, of course, it's, you know, one of the landmark comedy movies. You know, it was made into a Broadway musical, you know, a few decades later that starred Nathan Lane and Matthew Broderick, which in turn led it to be made into a film again with Uma Thurman starring 
um, you know, this is this is a classic. You know, it came out in '67. It's a good movie, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I'd recommend it. I, I, I definitely recommend it. Um, I would give. It, oh, well, let me just. So, Zero Mostel is a Broadway producer, and he's he's just trying to make money, but he keeps failing and failing and failing. And this accountant comes, and, and basically they come up with a strategy that if they if they make the, if they do if they produce the worst film, the worst play of all time on Broadway, there's a way they can recoup their investments and not have to pay it back. I think that's how it works. So they make a lot of money, but things don't go as planned. Let's put it that way. And they choose a play glorifying the Nazi Party, basically. But, you know, it's a comedy, and you know, I, I don't, I, I, I don't think at this stage in, you know, mod, in, in history that, you know, this would be um, considered a um, offensive, you know. You know, most people probably would find it funny, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the the, the, pe the person that directed this film is Jewish, you know, so. Um, but I give this film... Three and a half, you know, because it's okay with me. I, I don't know. I guess it's kind of funny, but I don't know. It was okay, you know. It was better than okay, but it, not great to me, you know. Um, close to close to a very good film. Pretty pretty very good, but it's almost there. So I give it a three and a half out of five. Uh, same day I watched the Lavender Hill Mob. I like this film, 1951. Directed by Charles Crichton, Ealing Studios again, starring Alec Guinness as well, and a, an appearance by Audrey Hepburn. I don't know if it was her first appearance in film, but she makes a brief appearance, and I thought to myself, that's Audrey Hepburn, and I was right, you know. And among other things, the director of photography on the movie was Douglas Locum. Um, he's a, he's a um, person that would later go on to do the cinematography for Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, because I've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark so many times, and I've noticed, you know, some of the the people that are credited credited at the start of the movie. I just I've seen it so many times, I just remember their names, you know. So, um, and I think the cinematography is not too bad here, but it involves like um, there's this one guy who works for the bank, Alec Guinness. And he's making a, not a comfort, well, an adequate living, but he's not rich, and he wants to be rich. He wants to have a really pleasurable lifestyle, and he and another guy want that. You know, I think the other guy works at the bank, too, and they, they, um, they're going to try to steal something, and, and the end of the process of trying to steal something they meet these two career, I think they're career criminals, and and through then they all devise a plan in order to get a lot of money and make it look like that, um, you know, like Guinness and the other guy didn't do anything bad, and the other two guys will escape by that point, and everything will be fine. And it starts off with Guinness in South America talking about, you know, how, how they did it, you know, in a flat, going back in the flashback and telling how they did it. And they, um, so they, you know, they take the gold, this, I think it's gold bullion or gold blocks or something, because Alec Guinness is, rides in the um, armored car when they take valuables from one place to another. And he, he's, he knows where the, his other partners in this scheme are going to be, and he then they take the armored car, they take it to a certain place, and they take the gold and they melt it, 
change it over, and I think they export it to, well, no, I don't think. They, they export it to France. You know, so, um, Eiffel Tower uh, miniature souvenirs. And then, then Guinness and the other guy go over there to, um, to France. But, you know, that's when the troubles start unwinding. Things go not as planned, and they see these young girls from a, like a boarding school or elementary school. They're buying the the, um, the Eiffel Towers that they were going to get, you know, and switch or whatever. I don't know, but they they try to get to the elevator at the top of the Eiffel Tower where these souvenirs are being sold, and Alec Guinness mint. Misses, just misses the elevator. And then this great sequence, which I highly recommend watching this film. It's got a few interesting scene, scenes that are really cool in it. And he's going, now, you know, special effects in those days weren't as advanced as they are today, but it still makes you bite your nails. It's um, the spiral staircase going down the Eiffel Tower. It, it makes you catch your breath. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Or, or not catch your breath, or whatever, you know. It makes you gasp, you know, is he going to make it down in time? And then, then there's a, the, 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 the um, elementary school students, they, they got on a, um, a boat that's headed for England, and Alec Guinness and the other guy are trying to get on the boat, but they need passport stamps. They need their passport stamps. They need their... They need their luggage. All these complications happen, but so they miss the boat. They may get to England later, and I'll leave it at that. But you know, um, things just don't go as planned. And and, and it, you know, and the great car chase scene at the end, um, to, cl close to the very end of the film, is a car chase scene. I, I highly recommend this movie. This is fantastic. I give this film um, four stars, four stars out of five. Okay, so now we get to the films I watched that, that are physical media. I watched them from two Criterion Eclipse box sets. Um, so I watched three of three, two on one and one on the other. This is early Fassbender. Um, I have seen the other two movies, I believe. Uh, well, actually, the first one I watched, I think around Christmas time last year, and the other two I've seen before, um, a while back. I used to own the other one until I owned this box set, then I got, I, I got rid of the the one I had because I didn't need two copies. Um, but these two I hadn't seen. This might be a second film, Fassbender's second, because its first one I believe is Love is Colder Than Death, which is the one I saw at Christmas time last year. Um, but this one's called Katzel Macher. It's got Fassbender there with, um, I think it's. Anna Shugula, who was in one of my favorite films of all time, and it's one of my favorite Fassbenders. Um, Beware, not, not Beware, um, Bitter Tears of Petra von Kant. Um, and, and this stars a lot of his, his regulars on here, um, like Erm Herman, who plays Elizabeth. She was also in Bitter Tears. She was a secretary of Petra von Kant in that film. Um, who else is in here that's of, of note? Fassbender makes an appearance as an immigrant in this film. I guess he's not really an immigrant or lo low-class person in reality, but he likes to play those roles according to uh, according to the Fox and Friends, I think it was, uh, documentary material I watched on the Criterion that I had with that one. Um, I think the actor who played, who was the main 
character in Merchant of Four Seasons is in this too. Um, but you know, it's like the characters are talking on on the street against against this building, and um, well, here I'm going to draw a comparison that I don't know if I qualify to do so or not, but sort of like a, I don't really watch Kevin Smith, but you could think of it like, what's that movie he did? Um, Clerks, Clerks, yes, where they're just talking in various places. I'm not really wild about his films, but you know, um, you could sort of think it similar to that in ways. Uh, you know, he, he uh, Fassbender was, and according to Maybe it was on the Petra von Kant. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I think it was more than just the Petra von Kant um, material that I've seen, um, you know, documentary material, but, you know, like Fox and his friends and Merchant of Four Seasons and um, Alex, Berlin Alexander plots, that he's, he was a pretty pessimistic guy and he didn't have much hope for humanity. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, and cancel mocker. So, so, anyways, you know, they're, they're trying to make their way. You know, they're trying to survive, and um, you know, the, they're young people, and um, they're, they're trying. They're trying to make. I don't know if they're making meaning out of their lives. They're just existing, I guess. If you, if that's the right way to put it. I don't know if I'm doing this film justice by talking about it. No, I think it's a very good movie. Um, I'll read the. I'll, I'll read a little bit of the back. Uh, second feature, Fassbender's second feature, depicts the intolerance of a circle of financially and sexually frustrated friends when an immigrant laborer played by Fassbender, moves to their Munich neighborhood. This scalpel-sharp, theatrical, experimental, based on one of the director's successful early stage plays, is both a personal expression of alienation on the part of the filmmaker and a comment on the persistence of xenophobic, xenophobic rather, scapegoating in German society. So he's really trying to put a magnifying glass on society, on Germany and showing um, maybe their hypocrisy or whatever. Um, yeah, but... Oh, oh and, and there's another thing about Fassbender. He's, he's, he's very much the power structure, which I think I discussed before when I showed those other Fassbender movies on a previous video that I showed you, that I was, you know, that I did. And, um, yeah, so, so that, you know, in, in this particular movie, like, Erm Herman, who's, who's, like, I've seen her in these submissive roles, like in Merchant of Four Seasons, The Bitter Tears of Petra von Kampf, and in this role, in this particular film, she's dominant, and she's telling, I guess it's her husband, that, what to do, and I get the money for you, and you just loaf around, and you know. So, they're not, maybe they're not pleasant films, but I, but I like them a lot. I think they're really interesting. Let's see, you know, maybe you know, maybe life isn't all, you know, wonderful, and sometimes think you know, sometimes bad things can happen to people. You know, it's not all sunshine and roses. And I think there are other directors sort of um, make this apparent, like Bergman, where I, where I'm, readily, I'm thinking of readily, you know. Um, anyways, so Katzelmacher, I give, how many stars? I give it four and a half. Maybe because he was just starting out. Um, maybe if his style was a little more intricate or whatever, maybe I give it five, but I'll give it four and a half. Uh, second film, myself, I found a and it's the eighth film I bought because it's on July 22nd. 
Oh, and the music's by Pierre Raven, who also did the music for the next one. Uh, Gods of the Plague is the next one I watched. It's the eighth film I watched. Um, this film, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just read a little bit of this. Harry Bear plays a newly released ex-convict who slowly but surely finds his way into the Munich criminal underworld. Meanwhile, his attentions are torn between two women, uh, Anna Shagula and Margaretha, Margaretha Montrada, and the friend, uh, Gunther Kaufman, who shot his brother. This sensual, artfully composed film by Viner Werner Fassbender is a study of romantic and professional futility. You know, so it's another one of those films with grim, sad outlooks, you know. I'm trying to remember this film. Uh, um, um, yeah, he's got, oh, he just got out of jail, which is sort of similar to Berlin Alexander Plots in that sense. Um, and he's trying to make something. Well, is he trying to make something in his life? Just uh, he trying to connect with the people where you know he was connected with before he got went into jail and um, I'm trying to remember this movie. I, I saw you know I saw it um, Sunday, July twenty second. Oh, that's what I was on my I was on my vacation at the time. Um, I'm trying to remember all of this. Um, Sorry if I'm holding this up, but I'm trying to remember this film better. But um, yeah, so I highly recommend this film too. I give it a, probably four and a half stars. But I wish I could get more into the details of what this film's about, but I can't remember it that well. I, I just um, uh, Sorry, but I, I do highly recommend it. Look it up on look it up on Wikipedia and IMDb. It's I think this 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 box set is worth buying. You know, if you want to buy a Criterion box set, an eclipse box set. It's DVDs, but I don't really see the point. That you know, Blu-ray or DVD. It just it's fine the way it is for me. But that's just me. Um, Gods of a Plague, I get four and a half stars too as well. It's edited by Fassbender, art directed by Kurt Rabe, music by Pierre, Pierre Raven. Okay, so Monday, July 23rd, I was also on my vacation, and I watched another movie from a, another uh, Criterion Eclipse box set, Curls of the Czech New Wave. I believe all these films, or most of these films, were, I think that, I wish I, I mean, I, I, I know some history, but I think the Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia, was occupied by the Soviets in the late 60s, early 70s. You can, if anybody knows, you know, the correct time period. But I, I think like they went into Hungary in the 50s or 60s I don't know they 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 took over more they, they took over a few more countries after the end of World War two you know before you know after a, after World War two ended of course you know Poland and Romania and Latvia and Lithuania and um, Estonia whatever were owned by the so Russian government and part of the Soviet Union some some of us part you know Soviet Union and Others were satellite countries, you know, that had Politburo, Politburo members. Um, but I think they extended a little out after that. But anyways, um, there's this really avant-garde film that was made called Daisies. And it really doesn't have much of a plot to it. Um, it's just two sisters, and they basically do all these wacky experimental type things 
they pretend they're puppets. Um, I don't know, they eat weird food. I, I can't remember. They, they seduce older men. Um, I wish I could remember it better, but, but I think I don't remember it better because it doesn't really have a plot, per se. Um, let me just read this. Maybe the New Way's most anar anarchic entry, Vera Chiotova's absurdist farce follows the misadventures of two brash young women leaving the world to be spoiled. They embark on a series of pranks in which nothing, food, clothes, men wore, is taken seriously. Daisy's is an aesthetic, aesthetically and politically adventurous uh, film that's widely considered one of the great works of feminist cinema. Yeah, so I I didn't love this film, but I think it's a significant film, and if you, I, I don't think it's a waste of time seeing it. I think I think it's worthy of seeing. So I'm going to give this film probably three and a half stars. I liked it, but I didn't love it. And last off, we got Friday, July 27th, and I was also on my, my vacation. I watched something on Shudder. Um, it was um, Document of the Dead. It was directed by Roy Frumke's, 85. It's a documentary about George Romero. Now, I think when I watched this documentary that they added more on, um, I have a... Dawn of the Dead box set, and, and it has this documentary, I believe, on it. But they added more stuff onto it, you know, like um, Land of the Dead, I think, was added on, and I don't, didn't cover when Romero actually passed away, but um, some of the additional material sort of made it not work as well, in my opinion. Um, sort of, was kind of looked like it was, um, uh, taped on, it was unnecessary, but um, it, it didn't, didn't flow right, right or whatever. But it's talking about his career and um, how, he, how he made films like Dawn of the Dead and um, how, how he tries to make a film on a lower budget and still like maintain artistic integrity. I don't know if I'm saying this right, but... but um, yeah, so George, George Romero is, is like, like it's following Dawn of the Dead and how they got this uh, mall to cooperate with them and, you know, he, how his, his producing, his producer, um, oh, I can't remember his name, um, Rubenstein, um, Richard Rubenstein, um, how he managed to get the capital and get this film made and yet still have George Romero have the freedom to go about doing what he wanted. And, you know, like um, when it came to distributors showing the movie, like George Romero didn't want to cut his film, you know, for the ratings board or for the distributors. So he just held out and he says that's going to be hard sometimes. I met, I met George Romero at a horror uh, convention a while back, um, a few years back. I think it was 2016, close to the time when he died, I believe. I think he, um, yeah, and I saw him. I saw him in a Q and A as well. There, he signed my Dawn of the Dead box set. But anyways, uh, that does it for this year. Uh, this. Uh, last few weeks um, um, I'll try and be on, a, be on here and I, oh when document of the dead I, I, I give it a rating of um, four stars out of five now, um, so I plan on doing this next week I don't know see, see why not that wouldn't be happening um, yeah so, so that's my list of films I think there's a lot of films on there that I highly recommend. Um, yeah, that's one, two, three, four.
five, six and a cent was due to. Yeah, most of these, these were good films or, or decent films. The one film that just, I didn't get Convoy. And anyways, that does it. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, take a look at my blog. I'll put it up here. I'll put it wait a minute, up here. Fools with Visions, blogspot.com. I'll leave that up for about uh, 20 seconds here. Just let the clock tick away so you can write it down if you want. Um, be sure to visit my regular, this YouTube channel, look at my GarageBand videos that are music that I've done with my guitars and my keyboard and um, um, the, the software that's available on the um, you know, the GarageBand program as well. Uh, there's some reviews. Um, there's my um, film that I'd love to make. I don't know when I'm going to make I could make it called Cost of Love. It's a storyboard that I have. It's a ways down. At the, you know, did it a while back, you know, the storyboard. But, you know, I'm trying to trying to, trying to get in the stage as a saving for, for a trip to Japan. So, I probably, uh, I, I, I'd like to buy these Beatles, Deconstructing the Beatles DVDs, but um, I'm trying to stop buying movies. And I, I bought some Criterions recently, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I, I, I'm finished with the sale, you know, the Barnes & Noble sale, and I'll show those off, uh, you know, at some point pretty soon, I would say. Um... Yeah, so thanks for watching. I, I, I don't want to hold you up any longer. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the near future.